So there's a famous place on the Washington coast. It's called the Ghost Forest. Have you heard about it before? It's out here, the coast of Washington. It's famous among geologists, at least. And the reason it's famous is because it's just like it sounds, a ghost forest. It's a cool name, but it's, it's a forest. There's a bunch of trees, and the trees are dead. They've been dead for centuries, and yet they're still standing. And it was a mystery for a long time, like, what's up with these trees? Who killed them? Why did they die? And uh, about 35 years ago, a geologist from Seattle showed up. Brian Atwater was his name, and he uh, paddled into, into the area with his canoe. And he found a bunch of clues that everybody else missed. He didn't really just work with the dead trees. He worked with the soil. He worked with the sediment layers below the soil. He worked with the elevation of the land. And he put together all this wonderful field evidence that built a case that those trees were killed by a big earthquake. And it was a big surprise to many, and uh, he spent years putting that evidence together. And to be a really good field geologist, you need to not only be dedicated, you must have good skill. Uh, it's not just luck that you find this evidence, you know where to look. And then you have to be creative and inspired and imaginative, and you need to have confidence. And it's a rare field geologist that has all of those uh, qualities, but this guy Brian Atwater had it. The confidence is important because nobody at the time thought that big earthquakes were possible on the Washington coast. I mean like magnitude 9 great earthquakes. But his evidence was so compelling that we now understand that was definitely the case 318 years ago. So you're checking your program. You're like, are we talking about earthquakes tonight? What's up? We're not. We're not. We're, 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 I'm starting with the ghost forest and earthquake discussion, but that's not what we're doing tonight. We're going to the Cascade Mountains tonight, the Cascades. And those are a line of beautiful volcanoes, we all know. The Cascades have these gorgeous volcanoes, and they look like this. They actually look like that. I mean, they actually look, these iconic, beautiful cones, these scoops of vanilla ice cream on the horizon. I mean, they're just majestic. They're volcanoes. But I'd like to take that cool name, Ghost Forest, and modify it for tonight. I'd like to talk about ghost volcanoes in the Cascades. Not a ghost forest, but a ghost volcano. And nobody calls that except me. I thought it was a cool name. <laughs> I like the ghost forest, and I wanted to come, get you to come to this lecture. So. We're going to go to these cascades and look for ghost volcanoes. So you're like, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're talking about. Well, these are the volcano volcanoes. Mount Rainier, Mount Adams, Mount Hood, Shasta down in California, Baker, Garibaldi. Take your pick. Those are the volcanoes that we have during our short time on the planet. Those are not the ghost volcanoes. But there's overwhelming evidence now that between these cones, this looks like a pod with a bunch of peas in it. Between these peas are a bunch of spots where cones used to stand. Mount Rainier-like cones. And the cones are gone. They just went away. And we want to look tonight at the evidence to reconstruct exactly where some of those cones used to be. There's dozens of these ghost volcanoes. Again, my words, not anybody else's. Ghost volcanoes. So instead of Brian Atwater, the guy I was talking about from Seattle, uh, the star of sh the show tonight is a Portland geologist who spent 40 summers making maps in one particular area and working with evidence that everybody else overlooked to reconstruct these ghost volcanoes. And we're going to focus on a place that's uh, uh, up valley from Yakima. In other words, Yakima, Washington, between Yakima and the crest of the Cascades, we're going to find evidence for five ghost volcanoes. And you're like, I've never heard this. I, well, I've driven that all the time. I drive to White Pass or Chinook Pass, a ghost volcano. You drive right through it. You drive right through a ghost volcano on US-12. You drive right through a different ghost volcano on State Route 410. So you're like, I'm not quite still sure I understand what a ghost volcano is, but I'm buying it because I love that Yakima area and I want to learn more about it. So we're going to talk about the Cascades as a whole, but we're also eventually going to zero in on this area that's been carefully studied by this fellow by the name of Paul Hammond, who was a Portland State Geology professor for 30 years from the early 60s until the early 90s, and then after retirement he kept going. And he'd pay kids out of his own pocket to, to continue the research. These young kids with their legs that can go up into the Goat Rocks wilderness, et cetera, and put these maps together. So there's evidence tonight 
for these volcanoes that no longer are there. And that's really our focus tonight. So that's the introduction. Let's get into something specific. Um, the Cascades uh, run from southern British Columbia down to northern California. And there's more than a dozen of these cones, and those are the Cascades that we know and love. There are no volcanoes further north. There's no volcanoes further south in this line, but there used to be. So the Cascades go back 40 million years. There's a 40 million year history with the Cascade volcanoes. However, if we go back 40 million years and look at a plate map, so this is North America, and this out here is a seafloor spreading center. This is a map 40 million years ago, 40 million years ago. So if you've heard of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it's a place in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that makes new ocean crust, and then the crust spreads away in both directions. We're making new plate material. It's an underwater mountain range. It's an active volcano. It's a whole continuous ridge. Uh, this is the East Pacific Rise, and it used to dominate the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. So this is North America. This is the western coast of North America 40 million years ago. And here are these two oceanic plates under the water of the Pacific Ocean. And this thing is called the Farallon Plate. I'm sure you haven't heard about it. The Farallon Plate, it's coming at North America. And this is the Pacific Plate, which still exists today. That's the one that's grinding along the San Andreas Fault. So when we had this monster ocean plate called the Farallon Plate, it was heading towards us, and then 55 miles offshore of the coast of North America, that oceanic plate started to dive. It started to subduct beneath North America. And that's really how we make big magma chambers like this, big underground rooms of hot magma that eventually get to the surface and feed volcanoes. So my first point tonight is that 40 million years ago, we had an intact chain of volcanic mountains from Alaska down to Mexico. Not just here in the Northwest, but we had Northwest-like mountains that were cone volcanoes, strata volcanoes, from Alaska down to Mexico. Why? We had this huge Farallon plate subducting beneath the entire West Coast of North America. Okay? But we're going to change that story as North America starts drifting west. So since 40 million years ago, the only thing changing is North America is going to start drifting. It's going to start drifting closer and closer to the East Pacific rise. So I'm going to flash forward to today. About 20 million years ago, the East Pacific rise, the thing that was making the Farallon Plate, started slipping beneath North America. In other words, North America started crossing this thing. And by the time we get to today, now here's North America. Now here's the west coast of North America. Now we mostly have the Pacific plate that's offshore of California, and there's no longer subduction because this oceanic plate is going towards Japan. And we only have a small little piece of the Farallon plate that's still around. That says JDF, that's the Juan de Fuca plate. So the reason we have the Cascades today is because we have the Juan de Fuca plate subducting and making our line of volcanoes that we know and love as the Cascades. But that's a remnant. I'll make a pea pod with a bunch of peas in it again. So that is that. But the real interesting question is, what happened to those volcanoes that used to be in California? In other words, if the volcanoes used to be here and they're gone, are they still there? Can you point to the volcano and just say that? Well, that's a volcano that doesn't erupt anymore. Or is it worse? Worse meaning is the volcano completely erased and gone, and you know where I'm going. Those are our first ghost volcanoes to talk about tonight. There are ghost volcanoes in eastern California, and we can do this. X's tonight are going to be ghost volcanoes, places where a cone is gone, but evidence is what we need to prove that that cone used to be there. So you're like, I'm intrigued now. I'm putting words in your mouth. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. <laughs> where can I find where these volcanoes used to be in California? The answer is the Sierra Nevada Mountains. So if you've been to Yosemite or King Canyon, Kings Canyon, excuse me, or uh, hiked on the John Muir Trail, 
or uh, take an I-80 over Donner Pass, you're crossing the Sierra Nevada Mountains of Eastern California. What kind of rock is in the Sierra Nevada Mountains? Thank you. Granite. Now, granite forms down here. So let's get rid of our subducting plate. Let's solidify the magma. Let's turn the liquid to stone. And now let's do some serious amounts of erosion. Let's erode. Let's erode. Let's keep going. Let's erode some more. Hell, let's keep going. Let's erode some more. And by the time we get done erasing, we're left with a mountain range called the Sierra Nevada Mountains, where even the very tips of the tops of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, Mount Whitney, the highest point in the lower 48 state, is made out of granite that formed underneath a volcano. So for the first time, we have a ghost volcano. Can you see it now? The ghost volcano was there, but it's gone. So what's our first way to prove that a ghost volcano existed? The answer is magma chamber rock. And if there's a lot of that magma chamber rock, and we'll go ahead and call it granite, but sometimes you can call it diorite if it's got some different chemistry. But if there's a hell of a lot of this magma chamber rock, we call it a batholith. You can have a batholith of granite or a batholith of diorite. It just means you got a lot of it. Okay? So batholith, eastern California, down south here, ghost volcanoes from a time when the Farallon plate used to subduct. Okay so far? Next big point. You love the Cascades? You better because they're not going to be here forever. You better enjoy the Cascades because they're going away. And you're like, oh my God, really? Like, glaciers are going away and now the Cascades are going away? What do I mean? Well, if you followed what I was just talking about, there's work to be done. The job of crossing the East Pacific Rise is not complete. Do you see what I'm saying? North America continues to drift west. And in the next five million years, I, I, there's an energy in the room like a sadness, like, oh, the Cascades are... <laughs> you got five million years to enjoy the, the Cascades before they go away. You got five million years, okay? Relax. All right. But eventually North America will continue uh, to cross the East Pacific Rise, and we will have nothing but the San Andreas Fault coming up through this whole scene. And our beloved Cascades, which are volcanoes, not ghost volcanoes, but volcano volcanoes, will eventually all go away. And we will have Snoqualmie Pass going across a batholith. In other words, we'll have a Sierra Nevada mountain range here in Washington and Oregon when our Cascades go away. So that's the broad story of going 40 million years to 5 million years into the future. Okay, let's zero in a little bit more on the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest. We should feel better. This is where we live. Uh, you are sitting right here in the Hal Home Center, right there. We are east of the Cascades. Okay, so the Cascades are 40 million years old. But am I really saying that Mount Rainier is 40 million years old? Or Mount Hood is 40 million years old? Or Mount Shasta is 40 million years old? I'm not. Individual cones in the Cascades have a two million year lifespan. A two million year lifespan. That's relatively short. I mean, we'd go for two million as humans, right? We, 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 what do we got, 80, 90, 100 years if we're lucky? We'd take 200 years. But these cones have a two million year lifespan, and yet that's short, that's a short life compared to the history of the Cascades. So now if you're a step ahead of me, you go, oh, I understand why we must have a bunch of ghost volcanoes in the Cascades. If these individual cones, these circles, these peas, if they only exist for two million years, and we got 40 million years of action, there must be dozens of ghost volcanoes in the Cascades, and there are. Each of those X's is a place where a cone had its moment in the sun for two million years, and then it went away. And another cone pops up, two million goes away. And another, this is all being fed by the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. But it's a bit of a mystery as to why these cones only exist for two million years and then they stop and go away completely and then their neighbor pops up and we get a new cone there. Okay, well we need to explore that a little bit because that's really the meat and potatoes of this lecture. 
What was Paul Hammond, the guy from the University, me, Portland State University, finding uh, in the east slopes of the Cascades between Yakima and the crest of the mountain? He was finding some batholith material, so that's one way to tell us that we had a uh, cone. And you're like, okay, well, I, I'm not sure I totally buy that. Well, you need to get the age of the batholith, the age of the granite. You need to get the chemistry of the batholith, the geochemistry, which minerals are present, what are the isotopes, the signatures, etc. And you need to build a case, just like Atwater was building a case with the ghost forest. So Hammond has been building this case for 40 years, 50 years really, but 40 summers. He trained dozens and dozens of young geologists over the years, many of whom are professional geologists now. So uh, it's a living laboratory for this guy, Paul Hammond. So if we make a quick list, um, maybe just three. So if we make a list of evidence for our ghost volcanoes, we've already talked about one. We talked about it in California, but I'm telling you that there's something called the Snoqualmie Batholith and the Index Batholith and the Chilliwack Batholith and places that you know, which are big blobs of granite and diorite that are the plumbing system of cones that used to, we used to have a cone right on top of Snoqualmie Pass, right at Snoqualmie Pass. It's ironic, when you cross the Cascades on uh, I-90 today over Snoqualmie Pass, you never see a volcano. You, there's never a glimpse of Rainier, but it is a volcanic mountain range, and there used to be. In other words, there's a ghost volcano on top of Snoqualmie Pass. A second way, and this is really the main way that Hammond is uh, making a case uh, in this place west of Yakima, is to look for partial cones. So let me explain what I mean. We know these stratovolcanoes are cone-shaped. We're, we're, we're fine with that, hopefully. So let's draw again. I'm not much of a drawer, but I can, even I can draw Mount Rainier. Okay, that's a cone. <laughs> so Mount Rainier is a full cone. It's not a partial cone because it's still active. If it erupts, it rebuilds itself, as we'll see tonight. St. Helens is an active cone. It erupted in 1980. It's rebuilding itself right now. Mount Mazama in southern... Oregon, known as Crater, excuse me, yes, known as Crater Lake, has Wizard Island. That's the, the mountain rebuilding itself. But if you truly are a ghost volcano, you lose elevation and there's no way to rebuild yourself because the magma's gone. There's no putty left to rebuild yourself. So partial, partial cone is just like it sounds. Let's make a couple more ghost volcanoes. And by the way, we can assume, just for a nice round number, that when we have our full cones, they're about 15,000 feet high. Let's pick a nice round number, 15,000. I know Rainier's not quite that, but let's just do that, okay? So 15,000 feet is the height of Rainier, roughly. There's a partial cone, in other words, a ghost volcano, just south of White Pass, where the bottom half of the cone is still there. But the upper half of it is gone, has been eroded, because it's a ghost volcano. This is known as the Goat Rocks Wilderness and the Goat Rocks Volcano. I might as well give you some ages right now. 2.6 to 0.6 million years old. There's our 2 million year lifespan. And so our Goat Rocks Volcano, I'll show you plenty of video clips and other things tonight, is a partial cone. In fact, it's truly a half. And uh, I'll show you a map of the Yakima area in just a second. Uh, a, a more severe version of a partial cone is where most of the mountain is gone. Most of it is gone. But we simply have the base that's left, the base of the cone that's left. And uh, there's certain kinds of deposits that prove we're at the base. There's oftentimes from a map or a Goodyear blimp view, a circular crater that helps us reconstruct that we are truly down there at the guts or the floor or the bottom of that old cone. So those are a second line of evidence to reconstruct these ghost volcanoes. I'm setting you up for all these video clips and, and, and images coming in just a bit. But there is a third way, and it's damn clever, a third way to try to convince somebody that a ghost volcano used to stand, even though the mountain is totally gone. You want to try to find flows, lava flows, or mud flows, that came out of the volcano when it was active, flowed 30, 40, 50 miles away. And even if the cone goes away, we still have the flows. 
Can you picture that? It's like we got the spider's legs, but we don't have the spider anymore, if we look on a map. And if you study the chemistry of those flows, and the age, of course, of those flows, you can reconstruct that. So on a map, we can look at a ghost volcano. These are typically dashed circles on a map, as we'll see over and over tonight. But we might have a lava flow that traveled, oh, I don't know, 50 miles. And I can't hold it. i got to say what it is now. So this particular ghost volcano, you know what? I can do that here. So I made a map for you before you showed up, before they opened the doors. And we had a Who concert in here, people fighting for their chairs. <laughs> Sorry if you can't see this well from the back of the room. But uh, if you're a good map reader, you can recognize this. This is Yakima, Washington. This is Mount Rainier. This is the crest of the Cascades. And we have one, two, three, four, five ghost volcanoes between Rainier and Yakima. And these white lines are highways. Here's 410. Here's US 12. And I got to tell you, I just get a pang of nostalgia every time I say US 12. You know, US 12 is a, is a national road. It's a US highway. It goes across the country. And I'm from a little town in Wisconsin. And US 12 goes through our little town in Wisconsin. <laughs> and our farm is two miles uh, west of town on US 12. That's how we used to say where our place is. If you go two miles out on 12, you'll see it on the left. <laughs> so when my parents used to drive out here to visit us in Ellensburg from Wisconsin, they'd just get on 12 and just follow it all the way to Yakima. <laughs> and then head north when they got to Yakima. OK. So I was going, I was, we're on number three here flows coming away from a ghost volcano. Uh, the partial cone is still there. This is Goat Rocks. This is the Fife's Peak ghost volcano. This is Mount Aches. This is Edgar Rock, and this is the Tiatin. We'll talk more about them in a second with the images. But we're talking about flows coming away from a ghost volcano. And an absolute freak show Meaning andesite rarely flows. Andesite is a kind of a lava that doesn't usually flow more than a couple of miles because it's too sticky. But for reasons that are still open for debate, the Tiatin andesite, first of all, it sucks because it didn't come out of the Tiatin volcano. It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a naming problem here. So the Tiatin andesite came out of the Goat Rocks volcano. And it traveled 50 miles. The Goat, ro the goat Rocks Eruption produced the Tiatin andesite lava, and I'm drawing it on the map here. Again, if you go to Rainier and you see some andesite lava flows, current andesite lava flows, meaning in the last few thousand years, those andesite lavas barely leave the national park. They don't get very far. But for reasons we don't totally understand, this one flow called the Tiatin andesite when the Ghost Rock volcano was a volcano, and not a ghost volcano, flowed 50 miles. This is Rimrock Lake. That was before the lake existed. And it came right down US 12, before SU 12 existed. This is, this is one and a half million years ago when this happened. And this Titan andesite made it all the way, almost, almost to the Fred Meyer in Yakima. <laughs> so Painted Rocks, if you know where that is. Kawichi Canyon. That's the end of the line for this Titan andesite. Interestingly, and I've got this map, so I might throw it in there. Have you ever stopped, if you're on US-12 and you cross White Pass, and there's a little Forest Service place to stop and have a picnic lunch and use the restrooms. It's called Palisades. Anybody know where it is? If you go to Packwood, you've gone too far. But it's a cute little spot. And there's a cliff there, and there's some beautiful columns, some rock columns. Uh, that's another lava flow that came from the Goat Rocks volcano. So this Gold Rocks volcano is a big structure, only half as big as it used to be. But we're using these flows, even though the mountain is almost gone, we're using the flows to reconstruct where it came from. Uh, I want to do one more thing with these chalkboards, and then we'll turn it over to the images. Have you ever driven on 12? Uh, in other words, uh, you leave Yakima, uh, stop and get some fruit. Uh, get a pizza and a beer at the new place there. Take a left at the Y. And then as soon as you take a left at the Y and you're on 12, 
by the elk feeding station, Oak Creek, there's some beautiful rock columns on the left, right? Beautiful wall. And uh, I don't know, if, if you're not a geology person, maybe you don't say anything, but if you're a geology person, you can't hold your tongue. You've got to start talking about it, right? <laughs> and uh, perhaps you start talking and you're saying wrong stuff. Like, hey, everybody, look out to the left now. We're at Oak Creek, and uh, that's a basalt lava flow, and those columns are from basalt that's cooling and cracking. Well, you're totally wrong. You know, and you're just going on and on and on, and people are like looking at the, you know, the passengers like doing the math, like, no, we're only going 30. If I do a shoulder roll, I can get out of here alive, and I want to listen to this guy more. <laughs> Even if I'm seriously injured, it's better than listening to more of this droning from this guy mansplaining to me about columns. <laughs> but let me cut to the chase here. Those columns are the Tiatananda site. Those columns are not in basalt. They're in this 50 mile long lava flow that came down from White Pass. And so the last concept, which is kind of tricky, now we're getting to real details on just that stretch, Oak Creek up to Rimrock Lake. You all with me? Kind of Rimrock Retreat, kind of in there. You're in the Tiatan Canyon. Um, so there are some columns. How can I do this now? This is. Um, uh, Yakima is over here, and uh, White Pass is over here. This is a crappy image now, but we're going to try it anyway. And uh, so there's the columns in the Tiatananda site are beautiful. They're not only tall, they're really exceptionally wide. And locally, they're called the, the Royal Columns, and the climbing community loves going there and rock climbing on those columns. Now, that's the Tiatananda site. And so that lava flow is coming from the Cascades. It's coming from White Pass. So I'm going to put west up here, and then I'm going to put east up here. And I want to put some letters here, if you don't mind. So uh, this is the Tiatan andesite coming from the Goat Rocks volcano. Again, that's the one that I think a lot of people think are basalts. But there are some basalt lava flows at certain places, in some places below the Tiatananda site, and some of those have columns as well. Now that is basalt, but that's lava coming from 300 miles away over by Idaho. So these are part of the flood basalts that are famous in eastern Washington. So the Tiatananda site from Goat Rocks Volcano, the basalt from Dam near Idaho. The fissures are way over there. Okay? So that's one of our tricks when we visit some of these places visually is, you know, I try not to say it too many times, it'll just get, you know, you'll start to try get out of the car. But um, are we looking at the Titan andesite columns or are we looking at columns from the basalt, which is 15 million years old? And this is, the, my main point is this is a geologic crossroads this area that Paul Hammond is mapping. He's not only finding Yakima, uh, Kawichi Canyon, Tiatan Canyon, Goat Rocks, Wilderness, etc. He's not only finding the ghost volcanoes, but here come the lavas from these cracks out in eastern Washington, the basalts that are flowing this way, that's this stuff, and then here's the Goat Rocks volcano, too small to see on this map, flowing from west to east. So it's a crossroads of two different lava flows with different signatures. And to the untrained eye, it just looks like a bunch of lava rock that's dark colored. <laughs> so perhaps this lecture can help with that. If you know and love this area, and why wouldn't you love this area? If you, if you don't know this area well, uh, it's beautiful. I mean, oftentimes the best geology places are just boring, dry, ugly places. This has got interesting geology, and it's absolutely spectacular scenery as well. So give us a second, and we'll talk about uh, uh, getting set up for the slides here. So I'll be with you in just a second. Thank you. All right, you ready? This can be a barrage of stuff, but most of it is uh, pretty pictures. So let's go ahead and get started. So we do have these gorgeous stratovolcanoes. There is no denying this. So today, what do we have? We have Mount Rainier. Today, what do we have? Volcano volcanoes, not ghost volcanoes. This is Mount Adams down by Yakima. This is Mount St. Helens, of course. That looks a little different because it was active on the morning of Sunday, May 18th, 1980. 
And uh, young people in the room, this is what Mount St. Helens looked like before 1980 and after the eruption. Mount St. Helens before the eruption in 1980 and after. But the key point is these are not ghost volcanoes. They still have magma and they rebuild themselves uh, pretty quickly. So we have regular eruptions of these cones after they rebuild themselves. We have no video of those first few seconds, but we have some photographs that help us understand what happened on that dramatic morning in 1980. This is Mount St. Helens. This is the pyroclastic blast out in front of the lahar and trees being blown over like matchsticks. And then for the rest of the day, ash coming out of Mount St. Helens, an active cone, still active, still has magma beneath it. And that fine ash is being blown downwind to communities like Yakima and Ellensburg. This is Ellensburg on top of Craig's Hill on that day, one o'clock in the afternoon. Too much ash in the atmosphere to see the sun. And the next morning on Craig's Hill, um, a fine ash that you can still find if you know where to dig uh, in your backyard. So St. Helens is still there. It is in the process of rebuilding itself, although right now it's pretty quiet. Now take that ash from 1980 and compare it to the ash that we can find from Mount Mazama, which exploded, also a cone, also an active cone, which exploded 7,700 years ago. And so here's a case where the whole mountain is gone and we're just left with the basal section, but it's an active cone, so it will rebuild itself. We only get a ghost volcano if we remove the heat, if we remove the magma system completely. So these are photos of Mount Mazama, better known as Crater Lake today. Now we're nervous that Rainier will do something like that, but there's no way to forecast that, and so we'll just hope for the best. That's not a great strategy, but we'll hope for the best. <laughs> and at least we're monitoring these mountains and can get a good sense of when activity is brewing. In other words, when magma moves, we have all sorts of seismic information to help us track that. So from downtown Tacoma, we can see Rainier. From Crystal Mountain, and we ski, we can see Rainier. You can see Rainier from downtown Seattle. Even on the east side over here, we see Rainier. It looks different than the west side because it's the east side of the mountain. You know, it looks different over here. And you can go to Sunrise in Mount Rainier National Park, and you can walk right up to the dang thing. You know, you put your hand right on it. <laughs> and some of you have spent years climbing to the top of Mount Rainier. And I applaud you for that. I'm not much of a mountaineer personally. And people come from around the world to visit Rainier because of these beautiful photographs and these beautiful wildflowers. And you can get out of your car and walk just a few feet and get experiences like this. It's a tremendously accessible place. And it's not just Rainier, of course. It's all of our stratovolcanoes in the Cascades. Now, we have been studying these cones for a hundred years and we still can't forecast the next event, but with Rainier, before we leave Rainier, there was a famous event that happened 5,600 years ago, and I'll show you this old animation, which is still the best I've seen, of the northeast flank of Rainier failing, a catastrophic landslide. The landslide converts into a mud flow. I know this looks like lava, but it's a mud flow. A lahar or a mud flow is just simply a, a landslide that converts into a flow because of so much water present. So here comes this Osceola mud flow, it's called, 5,600 years ago coming down the White River Valley. And when it finally gets down to the flats, down at Enumclaw, it starts flooding the South Puget Sound with all this material. We've got tens of thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of people living on top of this thing now, and Re Rainier has rebuilt itself, and so there is some concern. Interestingly, we really don't have, this is footage of, of, of a lahar, a volcanic mud flow. It's like liquid concrete coming down a river valley. It's a hazard, of course. <laughs> Boy, I didn't mean that to be funny, but I'm like... <laughs> but we, Paul Hammond, when he's reconstructing the ghost volcanoes in the area we're talking about tonight, there's really not a whole lot of lahars present. I'm not quite sure why that is. Uh, there are some lahars there, but they're much, much younger than the age of the, of the ghost volcanoes we're going to be talking about. I'm going to stick with this because this is St. Helens now, so mud flow coming down the Toodle River Valley in 1980. But we're sticking with it because now we revisit what Rainier looks like after it did its Osceola mud flow story, and there's this huge open horseshoe that uh, needs to be refilled. And again, it's an active cone, so magma will be 
coming to the surface and rebuilding the top of Rainier, which has happened in the last 5,600 years of, uh, of time. And so it's an ongoing process, and it's, it's, it's fun to kind of appreciate that. Okay, remember, we went broad there for a bit and talked about the Cascades being part of a much larger story. And here's the East Pacific Rise, which has yet to slip beneath South America. So another way to say this is North America used to look like South America today. South America has stratovolcanoes going all the way down its coast from north to south. They have the Andes. So we had an Andes mountain range, but it doesn't exist anymore because of North America crossing this East Pacific rise. That's what I tried to do with you on the chalkboard. East Pacific rise, East Pacific rise, and now the East Pacific rise is only still out in the water offshore of the Pacific Northwest, and that's why we've cornered the market on beautiful cones, and everybody else has lost theirs. From the side, this is what it looks like. North America coming in. Here's the subduction, feeding the cones, feeding the cones, but we're getting dangerously close 30 million years ago to crossing over the East Pacific Rise, at least in California. Animation, in case you can't quite put this together in your mind yet, subduction of an ocean plate, large volumes of magma, they rise, they feed, magma chambers, we're going to form batholiths of granite and diorite here, we're going to have cones up there. Until when? Until we get rid of the subducting ocean crust. If we can get rid of the ocean crust, then we'll get a bunch of ghost volcanoes. And that's what's happened in eastern California. Here's another animation in case you love these. The last 40 million years of time, uh, North America crossing the East Pacific Rise in the south and has yet to cross the East Pacific Rise on the north. Here's California losing its volcanoes as we speak as this time goes by. So if you go to eastern California and the mountains called the Sierra Nevadas, it's one huge batholith. There's different ages of magma, so you can reconstruct different ghost volcanoes, but generally it's one huge big pile of plutonic igneous rock. Here it is. We froze the pipes, we removed the subduction zone, and then in the case of eastern California, we actually actively lifted eastern California, and so that Volcano didn't stand a chance. God eroded away very quickly and easily and successfully. And the gold rush of 1849 is part of that story, by the way. So here's this batholith of granite then coming to the surface. And here all is that magma chamber rock, that batholith material today in Yosemite Park. I'm saying this is the future of Washington and Oregon's Cascades. Not bad, you know, you know, we're fine. We we'll, might lose our cones, but we'll still have gorgeous scenes like this to hike to. And you're like, well, I know places in the Cascades that are like this. And yes, you do. Those are places where there are ghost volcanoes currently. But I'm saying the whole Cascade Range is going to be one big ghost volcano once upon a time in the future. So here's our more than a dozen cones strung from British Columbia down to Northern California. Now, this is an important diagram. I didn't talk about this before. Let's get our bearings here first of all. So this is, you're in a, what are you? You're above Seattle in a hot air balloon. And you're looking east over the Cascades. You're looking west to east. Can you do this? Canada's on the left. Oregon's down here on the right. This is a north to south cross section of the Cascades. Snoqualmie Pass is right here. So Seattle crossed the pass and Ellensburg is over the horizon. Okay, hope you can see that because there's an interesting difference between the Cascade exposures north of Snoqualmie Pass versus south. What's the important difference? There's been more uplift of the Cascades north of Snoqualmie Pass than south. I don't have an answer for this. I don't have a reason why, and I've tried to go to all my sources, and they all kind of shrugged their shoulders. But we know that's true because magma chamber rocks, the batholiths in the Cascades, are dominating north of Snoqualmie Pass. In other words, all the ghost volcanoes are gone. All we, we don't have partial cones, in other words. We've either got magma chamber rocks, the batholiths, or we've got active cones like Glacier Peak or Baker. But south of Snoqualmie Pass, please notice that there's a bunch of these layers. Here are the partial cones and the lava flows like the Tieton andesite, etc. So Paul Hammond, this guy from Portland State's no dummy, he wants to find these ghost volcanoes. He wants some deposits to work with. So he went south of Snoqualmie Pass for a reason. 
So if we're north of Snoqualmie Pass, before we get to the Yakima area, it's the magma chamber rock we're looking at, and here's some specific examples. So just east of Mount Baker is the Chilliwack Batholith, 35 million year old granite. Who cares? Here's why we should care. We've got ghost volcanoes, don't we? That used to stand here. They're gone, but remember number one on our list of evidence? If you have a big batholith, you can place some ghost volcanoes on top of that. Let's go further south. Here is US 2 over Stevens Pass, heading towards Gold Bar and down to Monroe. Index Batholith, Grotto Batholith, Cloudy Pass Batholith, a few others I don't know the names of, and appropriate ages. And the one I'd like to stop and talk about briefly, the Snoqualmie Batholith, from 25 to 17 million years old. And you're like, hold on now, you said these cones only have a two million year lifespan. Well, we probably had multiple cones at different times during this time frame. Perhaps the cones were actually nested. Perhaps they were parasitic on each other. You've been to the Three Sisters? Those are three strata cones that are kind of growing on top of each other. So that kind of a scene could be appropriate, but notice we're right at the pass. We're right to the north of the pass. Some of your favorite Cascade hikes are leaving from I-90 and going north. If you're not there in a weekend, it's a pleasant experience. <laughs> so here's looking east, up into Snoqualmie Pass country, and I'm telling you that none of those mountains are volcanoes. Then none of them are active cones and only some of them are part of the Snoqualmie Batholith. Again, the pass is up ahead. This is the westbound side. Franklin Falls is right below this overhanging bridge, and this is part of the Snoqualmie Batholith there. So remember, with the Snoqualmie Pass area and north, we lose all the cone material, and instead we're focusing on these batholiths that are exposed if we can get rid of the cones themselves. Let's do more with the Snoqualmie Batholith. It's a beautiful rock. That granite is absolutely spectacular. And if you get a good image with a, with a, I guess that's a dime there, we've got real detail with quartz and biotite and a bunch of key minerals that can help us reconstruct the chemistry of what that volcano was like. So in the case of the Snoqualmie Batholith, we've got two pieces of evidence to put a ghost volcano or two on top of that. What's one? the batholith itself. What's another? A lava flow that flowed from the cone, that's now a ghost volcano, that makes the escarpment for Snoqualmie Falls. So we've got a lava flow and Snoqualmie batholith matching in age, matching in chemistry, and these are the kinds of things you can do if you're clever and piece those ghost volcanoes together. Here's an old favorite shot of the Sunset Highway crossing uh, near uh, Snoqualmie Falls. Now there's history, of course, with Snoqualmie Pass as well. We got Model Ts back in the 20s, and we've got uh, more modern vehicles in the whatever, 50s, 60s, I guess. And even today, they're blasting like crazy the last few winters, excuse me, summers, uh, to make that a more safe area. So what are they blasting? They're blasting flows from ghost volcanoes. That's the Ohanapakash formation. Let me show you some more photographs. They're Working with the flow, they don't know it, the guy's working there probably. Actually, they do. I had a, we, we filmed a little video up there, and the guy says, I, well, I'm curious about this rock, what can you tell me? And I'm like, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't done my homework. But I know now, I need to go back up and tell those guys. <laughs> so this is the dangerous curve that they've been blasting back to get a third lane up in there, and these are all uh, lavas, uh, andesite lavas, rhyolite lavas, dacite lavas that are too old to work with the modern cones, so these are ghost volcanoes. Uh, the location of the ghost volcano is still undetermined, as far as I can tell. But these are spots that you recognize, I think, at Hayak and other places. It's all lavas from volcanoes that no longer exist, a.k.a. ghost volcano. But now we finally leave Snoqualmie Pass and we get down to the Yakim area, which is where we want to be the rest of our time tonight. And here's a living color map of what I tried to do on the white chalkboard. Yakima, we are located here in Ellensburg. Here's the Y, US 12, 410. Chinook is here. White Pass is here. You're in National Park country there, Adams and St. Helens. Got your bearings? Now, here's Paul Hammond saying, look, if you really start mapping these ghost volcanoes, you got a bunch. 
And we're just focusing on five between Yakima and the pass. So you recognize this. This is Rimrock Lake. It's an artificial lake. It wasn't there naturally, but they built the dam in the 20s uh, to make a reservoir there. Uh, there was no lake at all before uh, they built the dam. But it's a beautiful lake, and there's cabins, and there's a boating community, et cetera, on Rimrock Lake, and there's all sorts of wonderful places to camp and get some snacks at the Rimrock Grocery. And I'm not a botanist, but I think these are ponderosa pine trees that are really beautiful on the east slopes of the Cascades. Now here's the guy we're talking about tonight, Paul Hammond, the guy who is about to turn 90 uh, and is still at it, still working on the maps, still working on these stories and training all these young folks. Uh, so he's had more than 50 years of training of people who are eager and wanting to learn from the master. And he's an understated, humble guy. But these are the kinds of maps that he's been creating, hand-drawn maps, hand-colored maps, year after year, keep modifying the maps, keep getting new samples, keep getting more geochemical data to piece that all together. And he has uh, devoted his time in past summers to local cabin owners um, to learn about their surroundings from this guy. Classic Paul Hammond illustrations, colored, hand-drawn. This is the schematic cross-section of all these different batholiths of different ages and their relationships. Uh, from the archives, Paul's son uh, managed to find a few old photos of Paul. So these are just a few weeks before Mount St. Helens erupted. So this is Paul, the guy who's about to turn 90, but we're back, we're turning the clock back now to 1980. And he's working with students even back then. <laughs> Think of the excitement. He's already worked in the Goat Rocks area for 20 years, and, and St. Helens is about to go. You know, he's been trying to imagine an eruption, and, and now it actually happens uh, uh, south of his field area. There's a lot of pointing in these photos. <laughs> One more example of the detail and the fine craftsmanship of Paul Hammond and his geologic sketches and maps. Now this is me taking Paul's work and trying to make it even more simple, which is, you know, I'm guilty of that. I make things sometimes too simple. But in the case of Paul, here's what I tried to show you on the black chalkboard. Active Cohen Rainier. Here's our Goat Rocks volcano, which is a ghost volcano, but not, hasn't been ghost for very long. Remember, this is the one that's still half, is, half of it's still there. But here's 410, and here's 12, and here's Rimrock Lake, and can you now see our players? Mount Aix, 24 million. Fife's Peak, 23, Edgar Rock, 26, Bumping Lake Pluton, 28 million, Titan Volcano, 25. I don't have an answer for why all these ages are close to each other. What was going on in the mid-20s, 20 million years ago, to have all this action in this small area? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And I meant to make a professional diagram, never got to it, so this is a doodle on my <laughs> desk and my, mar my Sharpie markers, but you get the idea. We have different levels of erosion uh, with these different partial cones. And if we put them together, uh, I don't know, you can pause this if you're watching it and try to connect the dots here between these places. We don't want to do that. Uh, in the case of the Tyatin volcano, another good piece of evidence that you're driving through a ghost volcano, you see all these dark blue lines? These are all dikes, and a dike is a vertical injection of rock through horizontal layers. And a stratovolcano typically has thousands of radial dikes, they're called, throughout the mountain. So even though most of the Tyatin volcano is gone, these individual dikes have been mapped. Hundreds of them have been mapped, this time by Don Swanson, a different geologist. But the point is, here's part of the guts of the Tyatin volcano, and even deeper, Goose Egg Mountain, Westfall Rocks, Kluchman Rock, Chimney Rock, those are parts of the magma chamber of the Tyatin volcano. So we're looking at Rim Rock. Uh, we're looking at parts of the magma chamber of the Tyatin. So we're one of these ghost volcanoes now. It's 25 million years old. And you might recognize this. This is right by the dam. You can drive right through one of these magma chambers, one of these batholiths. So this is Westfall Rocks but you're driving through the uplifted batholith of the Tyatin volcano. Beautiful craftsmanship on that tunnel, by the way. And I had help from some locals, Ray and Steve and John, who were finding good spots for us to film and also to take students and other field trips. So again, big magma chamber, batholith, think the batholith of the Sierra Nevada mountains, if you like, 
just a smaller version. Tiatin volcano, the ghost volcano. The volcano's gone, but we're looking at the magma chamber rock. And in certain places, that magma chamber has been heavily eroded uh, to these pinnacles of Kluchman rock. Uh, so we've been here looking at the magma chamber, and I was showing you a photo or a map of the radial dikes of the Tiatin volcano. So I wasn't kidding. You drive on Highway 12 right through this ghost volcano if you stop and have a meal at Rimrock Retreat. Now, since that, uh, I brought my students, my central students down there. So we have a Pacific Northwest class. And so we went down three Wednesday afternoons in a row. And they read scientific papers by uh, Paul Hammond and others. And we had discussions and we hiked together. And these are some of these columns that I want to be talking with you about in just a bit. So some of you know that these, this Tiatin andesite, these columns are right there next to the road. Uh, and they're part of this story. So if this is, if this is all the Tiatin andesite, where did that lava come from? I say, if this is the Tiatin andesite, where did this lava come from? The Goat Rocks volcano, very good. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful columns in this Tiatin andesite. Is it an andesite or a basalt? It's called the Tiatin andesite, so it's an andesite. Of course it is. Good job, you're two for two. Everyone knows the spectacular cone-shaped stratovolcanoes of the High Cascades. But the Tiatin River Canyon, them west of Yakima, a four and a fifth ancient volcano, which stood where we now have Goat Rocks Wilderness. The Tiatin River tumbles from high in the Cascade Mountains down to the sagebrush and lush orchards of central Washington. Everyone knows the spectacular cone-shaped stratovolcanoes in the High Cascades, but here in the Tiatin River Canyon, there are stories to be told of huge cone volcanoes just west of Yakima, four of them, and a fifth volcano that used to stand at Goat Rocks Wilderness. A Mount Rainier-like volcano once stood right here. The volcano is gone, the lava flows are gone. The only thing remaining are monoliths down there above the lake that are part of the magma chamber from 25 million years ago. In the dark, the magma solidified, diorite that's 25 million years old. This was the magma chamber, the plumbing system underneath that cone. The volcano is gone, but these monoliths tell us that this was ground zero for a beautiful stratovolcano. Now, let's switch it up just briefly. We all live here, or many of us do. Some of us are from out of town. And there are some white cliffs up by Thorpe on Highway 10, the old road to Cleallum. Those white cliffs are part of this ghost volcano story from Paul Hammond's area. The volcano, 10 million years old, younger than the ones we were just talking about, used to stand just north of White Pass, between Bumping Lake and White Pass. And that volcano made a lahar, a volcanic mud flow, and followed an old river valley up to here. This is before Menashtash Ridge and Umtanum Ridges grew. So even in our little valley, our picturesque valley, we've got tentacles of flows that came from the ghost volcanoes down by US-12. Those are not sandstones, those are lahars. If you don't believe me, I'll take you out and prove it to you. It's all sorts of pumice and other deposits that mean it has to be a volcanic mud flow, it cannot be a sandstone. There is sandstone in the area, but not here. Ghost volcano, 10 million years old, flowed volcanic mud flow material to Thorpe. Okay, to finish up, we're back to our area that we've been studying with Paul Hammond. Crappy photo of Mount Rainier. Crappy photo of the Goat Rocks volcano, half as big. We've chewed off the top of it. And again, we're now zeroing in on the Goat Rocks volcano. One flow heading towards the Palisades picnic tables and the uh, restrooms. Uh, another flow, this is the Tiatin andesite flowing 50 miles almost to the Fred Meyer in Yakima. Now, how can we find that Tiatin andesite? What does it look like? 
Well, here's one way to do it. Again, this is a rather dangerous curve to stop and lead a geology field trip. But this is all Tiatan andesite. And we're going to pan up with the iPhone here. And this is all Tiatan andesite, the lava flow that's not basalt that came from the Goat Rocks volcano. Now, keep in mind that there's different kinds of volcanoes worldwide, and the volcanoes have different silica content. And we have been firmly in this picture the whole way tonight. But if we are talking about basalt, and we are at selected places in that canyon, the Tiatin Canyon, we got to go to this kind of a picture. So here's a quick departure and reminding ourselves that a completely different volcanic story involving cracks and fissures and flood basalts from damn near Idaho and flowing all the way to the ocean are invading this Paul Hammond area. We're still way out in eastern Washington now looking at all these lavas, but if we follow those lavas approaching Yakima, you can see how thick some of these lava flows are. They're going to invade the Yakima area, Natchez, and they're going to work their way right up to the Rimrock Lake area. So do you see what I mean? It's a crossroads. We got lava coming down Highway 12 and we got lava coming up Highway 12, depending on which lavas we're talking about. So these are the fantastic columns of basalt, not andesite, out in central Washington and eastern Washington. And yes, these are basalt. And yes, that guy who's explaining this all to us, that is common for basalt. It's rare to find columns in things that are not basalt lava, but you can find them, like in a place called the Tiatin Canyon. So this is another little episode from our TV show, and I think we're just going to skip it. No, we're not, because we're going to keep with this because we paid some money to make a little animation to show how these columns form. So let's get our money's worth here. This is fun. I can put my own words on top of this instead of uh, being confined. So I'm talking about the columns forming from cracking the lava as it cooled. I'm hanging on to my hammer very carefully in this particular shot. Uh, yeah. uh, drone footage going down on top of these columns and looking how perfect these columns are from the air. Oh, you like that shot. OK, good. I do too. My hammer's right in there. And now we're comparing it to Hawaii, which doesn't really work because the scale is totally wrong, but the chemistry is right. And now here's the animation. So we say to the guys at the animation studio, hey, can you make one lava flow? Can you start to cool it, but keep the inside red hot? And these cracks are going to start crackling their way towards the interior of the flow as we do that. And they're like, yeah, I think we can do that. And then I'm going to cut it right here. But they finished the animation by having the Ice Age floods out in eastern Washington rip off the top of this lava flow. But in the case of the Tiatin andesite, it's a perfect analog for what we have right here. I'm going to show you some photos now of the Tiatin andesite. And there's going to be columns at the bottom half. And there's going to be this weird chaotic zone called the entablature, which no geologist still really understands. But it's just like in a simple drawing like this. The next time you drive up US-12, you'll see this. And please keep in mind that this is one flow. I know it looks like two different layers. I know it looks like two different flows. But the next time you see this, or in a second when you see this with the video, this and this are from one eruption of the Tiatin andesite coming down from the Goat Rocks volcano. Look at that. So here's the bottom of the Tiatin andesite flow. Here's the top. And this is that boundary between the columns at the bottom that are insulated as the lava cracks and cools, and then this chaotic entablature up above. So the point is, we study the Yakima area, and we realize we have invasions of basalt lava, which is really kind of getting in the way of our story. But this is not basalt lava. Again, this is the Tiatin andesite. These are the royal columns and the entablature up above. So I've been showing you some photographs from basically right in here. And some of you might know those trails right in there. It's, it's really a gorgeous place. And we had a big field trip in June. And we took people to some of these spots. Again, Tiatin andesite, columns at the bottom, and tablature up above. Go across the swinging bridge. Um, people of all ages on the trip. It was quite a circus. We had too many people on that trip, but we made, we made it work. And uh, have you stopped here at Oak Creek and walked across this bridge? And uh, uh, again, the columns of the Tiatin andesite. I can't say that enough. 
uh, beautiful, you know, May morning. And uh, this is an interesting spot because you can actually see what the valley shape was like when that Tyatin andesite flow came down it. In other words, it's very rare to actually have a, this is, I'm getting carried away now, but this is a ghost valley. You can actually see the exact geometry of that valley that this lava flow came flowing down. And if you get the base of some of those columns, they look just like basalt, but they're not. We've made that point a million times. One beauty thing, beautiful thing about the Tyatin andesite is it has a very distinctive look in hand sample. It's got these big crystals in it, and the crystals are there regardless of where you find it. So it's rare for a lava flow to have this kind of a distinctive look. And this is a beautiful photograph from Daryl Gussie, who we're going to meet in just a second. But we have, turns out there's actually two Tyatin andesites, two separate flows from that ghost volcano. So here's the older flow of Tyatin andesite, columns and entablature. There's that valley wall. But I was showing you photos before at this dangerous curve, and this is a younger Tyatin andesite flow. And so for many weeks, I was out there with my students, and I'm like, I don't get this. Why is the old flow up high, and this flow, which is about 250,000 years younger, lower and next to the river? I just couldn't get that geometry in my head, and they thought they had it, and they drew it out, and then they'd start to get confused in the middle of their drawing. And we went back and forth on this for a while. And so for at least me, I don't know about you, but it only works for my head if I can get it drawn just the right way. So this is my attempt to show you how we can get two different Tyatin andesite lava flows into the same valley and have the young flows lower in elevation than the older. So panel-wise, here's the old valley. We're going to fill it almost to the top with Tyatin andesite coming from the Goat Rocks volcano, getting all the way to the Fred Meyer and Yakima, 1.64 million years. Here's the shocker. Between 1.64 and 1.39 million, these are dates from Paul Hammond and his team, that's you know, less than half a million years. And we're removing damn near all of this andesite. We're only leaving little fragments of this beautiful thick stuff perched on the walls of the canyon. And then when this next flow comes in, uh, the valley floor is actually deeper than it was originally. So was that just river cutting to take all that basalt away? Is that, excuse me, is that river erosion just to take all this andesite away? Are there glaciers involved? Well, the glaciers didn't get this far down the valley. The glaciers only got to the Rimrock area and not any further south. Excuse me, further down away from the crest of the Cascades. So with that concept, I'm going to go back. With that concept of, of perched little fragments of the Tyatin andesite, let me help you try to see some of these things. They're absolutely gorgeous, and you'll never um, not look at them again when you're driving this, dri this stretch. I think that was a double negative. <laughs> this is one little leftover piece of the first Tyatin andesite that used to fill the entire picture. It's all gone except for this and a couple other places. On a map, that used to be a purple ca uh, caterpillar all the way through here. In other words, the Tyatin andesite flow filled the whole valley. But today, uh, this is Daryl Gussie's map, we've only got these individual little clumps. Let me show you a few more examples. That footbridge, there's another little remnant of this major flow that filled the entire valley. Unbelievably, an andesite lava flow almost made it to what is now the city of Yakima. Look at these columns, right along Highway 12. This thick Tyatin andesite used to fill this valley wall from side to side. And most of the lava is gone. Most of the columns were taken out of here. And there's just a few scraps of thick, tilted columns perched precariously above the busy Highway 12 between White Pass and the city of Yakima. All right, if we go up to White Pass and cross and head over to Packwood, this is the spot I'm talking about. Maybe you'll stop next time if you've never stopped there before. And sure enough, we've got those same columns across the draw, and that's another flow, another andesite flow. Actually, I think it's a daysite flow from the Goat Rocks volcano. This is from the panel there 
and they don't talk about the Goat Rocks volcano on this panel. They're out of date. We're going to finish by going up into the Goat Rocks itself and actually look for where that Titan andesite came from specifically. A much, much younger story of an ancient volcano is also here in the area between White Pass and Yakima. The Goat Rocks volcano stood tall for two million years, but the volcano died a half million years ago and the top half of the mountain is now gone, ravaged by powerful glacial action. Up here near the Goat Rocks wilderness, there's a volcanic rock layer the Tiatan andesite that's super distinctive. Look at these crystals inside of this lava rock. They're enormous phenocrysts of something called plagioclase felspar. And normally when you have a lava flow with big crystals, the lava flow does not travel very far. But this Tiatan andesite flowed 50 miles away from its source. But if we get up on Pinegrass Ridge, we can see those same fat columns way up in the mountains now in addition to finding those big fat columns down by Highway 12. And Pine Grass Ridge, if you know it, is uh, very flat because it's on top of the Tiatan andesite flow. So we're getting closer and closer to the source. The vent must be up in the wilderness area itself. And that's what we're gonna finish with. We're gonna get right up there. So Daryl and John are gonna get us up. We're gonna hike up to, uh, or we're gonna drive up into uh, this trailhead to Bear Creek Mountain. We're going to get up. Uh, my knees were shot last summer, but I, I managed to get up with these guys to an overlook looking into the goat rocks on a Monday morning. So, Daryl, thanks for taking me up here. Where are these vents you're talking about with the tides and andesite? Well, you can see Bear Creek Mountain in the middle here. And on each side of it, on the, on the right hand side, is the younger vent. And then on the left hand side, that knobby area is the older vent. And then you can see a series of lava flows that and I think partially buried the, the older vent there. How'd you know those were the two vents? Well, the, the vents were kind of, they have distinctive geochemistry. Um, the, the, the chemistry of the rocks is, um, is different enough for each of the vents that they relate to the chemistry we have for the, the Titan andesite flows further down in Titan Canyon and towards Yakima. Here are some photos from Daryl to show the exact vents and only a few geologists in the room might recognize that this means we're right at the vent. We've got a glutinate, we've got spatter, we've got all sorts of deposits that are falling out of these vents. There's all sorts of very special volcanic deposits that tell us this is ground zero up in the goat rocks for those two Tiatan andesite flows. The big one, the thick one, and then the smaller one that managed to flow into a lower valley. Daryl and John working in association with Paul Hammond. So we got Daryl on front on the camera with this, uh, with this uh, little short TV show. 100 years ago, field geologists speculated that the distinctive Tiatan andesite erupted from Mount Rainier. But recently, Forest Service geologist Daryl Gussie has traced the Tiatan andesite on foot back to its precise source deep in the remote Goat Rocks wilderness. It took the older Titan andesite lava flow about 12 years to flow from Bear Creek Mountain to Cowichi Canyon just outside of Yakima. The older flow was dated at 1.64 million years old and the younger flow was dated at 1.39 million years old. A difference of about 250,000 years between the lava flows. Those dates put us squarely in the Ice Age where lava flows and glaciers were competing for space. If this Cascade stuff intrigues you and you know the Cascades like the back of your hand and you want to know more, there's lots more that has been figured out in addition to this work by Paul Hammond. I highly recommend this roadside geology book written by Pat Pringle. It's mostly of Mount Rainier National Park, but he goes outside of the park, including the areas we were talking about tonight, and it's beautifully done, and there's tons of references for that as well. And one of the areas that I'm just started to get interested in and may follow through on a lecture down the road is between the Goat Rocks and Portland 
Every one of these black dots is a very, very young vent, much younger than the goat rocks. During the ice age, we've got uh, cinder cones and other little volcanic events that are like erupting into ice. And you've got spatter and ash falling on top of glacial ice and burning holes underneath the ice. And I don't know hardly anything about these vents. You might know, but I don't yet. Even the hills outside of Portland are full of these very young volcanoes, cinder cones, around Goldendale and other places like that. So that's on my list and maybe on your list too. So here's hats off to Pat Ham, Paul, excuse me, hats off to Paul Hammond for all of his work, a lifetime worth of work helping us see evidence for the ghost volcanoes in the Rimrock area. And perhaps one day even Mount Rainier will become a ghost volcano. Thanks for coming tonight, everybody. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thanks much.